Mysticism and rationalism are often seen as diametrically opposite positions. While mysticism involves direct, non-discursive intuition or insight, rationalism is founded on rigorous, logical deduction. Indeed, mystical insights often take the form of contradictory, ecstatic disclosures, while rational deduction has become a purely formal, often mathematical affair. The two seem separated by an insuperable gulf, Yet, that very gulf may say more about our philosophical presuppositions than it does about either mystical experience or rational deduction. Abraham Abalafia, perhaps more than most mystics and philosophers, managed to bridge this gulf by combining the rational rigor of the philosopher Maimonides with the prophetic ecstasy of Kabbalah. In this episode of Esoterica, I want to explore the philosophical and mystical underpinnings of Abraham Abalafia's combination of the rational and the ecstatic in his prophetic Kabbalah. This episode is also special because it's a part of a collaboration with my friend and colleague Philip Holm over at Let's Talk Religion. I really deeply admire Philip's work, and you absolutely have to check out his channel, especially if you're interested in Islamic mysticism or Sufism. His episode will provide an overview of Abu Lafia's turbulent life, his overall thought, and his works, so make sure to check it out in the card above. Also, make sure to subscribe over at Let's Talk Religion as well, and tell Philip hello from Esoterica. If you're visiting from Let's Talk Religion, I want to welcome you. Make sure to subscribe and check out my other content and topics on esotericism, magic, Kabbalah, alchemy, the occult, hermetic philosophy, and more, all from a scholarly perspective. But now, let's turn to an analysis of how Abu Lafia created the prophetic Kabbalah by combining both the mystical and the philosophical. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. Let's first get this out of the way. Abu Lafia's Kabbalistic system is extremely complicated, and it's basically impossible to summarize. Indeed, it underwent several revisions during his lifetime as he experimented and thus improved the techniques by which he arrived at prophetic ecstasy. In short, what survives is a progressive meditation system by which one's mind and soul are increasingly purified and elevated until eventually arriving at union with the divine. Although in a very particular sense, a lot more on that in a bit. The meditative system begins with physical purification and strict religious observation especially the wearing of tefillin, or the black boxes containing scriptures during morning prayers. This is followed by strict concentration upon Hebrew letters by writing them out in various permutations. This letter meditation is deeply influenced by the Book of Formation, or the Sefer Yetzirah, a text describing the creation of reality itself through what the text calls the Ten Sefirot Belima and the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. If you want to learn more about the Sefer Yetzirah, check out my episode in the card above. Following the meditation of writing, one moves to a higher level of abstraction by chanting the Hebrew letters. This is perhaps done with music, which likely indicates Sufi influence. This is accompanied with breathing techniques and very specific head movements, 
which somewhat spell out these Hebrew letters. From here, one moves into the realm of the pure spiritual mind, projecting letter forms onto the astral body or the tselem via the imagination, but eventually passing beyond the imagination to pure spiritual intellection and eventually to communion with the divine in the form of the active intellect. In fact, it's this concept of the active intellect that I want to focus on most in this episode, so much more about this highest ecstatic moment in a bit. As one passes through this highest stage, we're told of four quasi-supernatural effects that begin to unfold. Light begins to emit from the body. The body itself becomes diaphanous, as if it were made with light itself rather than having a physical form. Third, the eye of the imagination gives way to pure intellectual vision. And finally, one is gripped with ecstatic, overwhelming fear and joy. After this final breakthrough, one is given a glimpse of one's astral body or astral double, often called the tselem or the image of oneself, which often results in the ability to prophesy as if one were at all times at once. In the final ascent, one's spiritual intellection becomes the self-same, if only for a moment, with the divine of the agent or the active intellect. In this highest unitive moment, the visions and experiences fuse messianic power, eschatological visions, and the erotic death of the divine kiss, which culminates in the annihilation and rebirth of the mystic, as if impregnated by the divine influx. I suspect that at this point, you're beginning to see why Abu Lafia then and now is such a controversial figure in the history of Kabbalah. He is simultaneously subject to the humiliation of excommunication, or karait, and yet called, quote, among the masters of secrets, his name being great in Yisrael. Abu Lafia's ecstatic or prophetic Kabbalah is at the center of a debate in the history of Jewish mysticism. That is, does Kabbalah or Jewish mysticism more generally include the concept of the union with the divine? Famously, Gershom Sholem argued that it absolutely did not, while Moshe Edel has in fact shown that this concept does in fact appear in the mystical techniques of Abu Lafia. While I think Idel is correct here, I want to contextualize Abu Lafia's concept of divine union because it is, as you might imagine, peculiar and philosophically quite specific. To get at this, we need to unpack two interrelated concepts. The first is the concept of the active or agent intellect as it appears in Aristotle and the reception of this idea from his De Anima and the second is how the active intellect is crucial to understanding Maimonides' conception of prophecy. Let's start with Aristotle, and I promise I'm going to do my very best here not to get into the weeds too much. For Aristotle, a being cannot spontaneously transform from a state of potentiality to one of actuality without an outside cause. Well, the only exception to this rule is famously God who is pure eternal activity in the form of thought thinking about itself. Our mind, insofar as it starts in a potential state, requires an outside agent to activate it, so to speak. This active or agent intellect is described in De Anima chapter 3-5, probably the most obscure passage in all of Aristotle's writing as being, quote, separate and unaffected and unmixed, but also, quote, deathless and everlasting, and is the ground of our conscious intellection, but we have no memory of it. Upon our death, it appears that our passive mind also dies, but, perhaps, what was our active mind, or the active intellect, persists eternally. 
Now, this section in Aristotle is notoriously vague, and no one has any real idea what he meant. But as early as Alexander of Aphrodisias in the 3rd century, this active intellect was identified with God, and debates raged in both Christianity and especially in the Islamic world about just what the active intellect was. Was it God, or the world soul, or some kind of hypostasis of God, or maybe an angel of some kind? We ain't gonna settle that because it ain't settleable, but the idea that the active intellect was divine in some fashion was current to the great Jewish philosopher Maimonides via Islamic philosophers, and that is where we have to turn to now. The philosopher Maimonides is so famous that there is a saying in the Jewish world, from Moses the son of Amram to Moses the son of Maimon, there arose in Israel none like Moses. Yes, he gets likened to none less than Moses, like Ten Commandments, Burning Bush, you know, Moses. Maimonides is famous for his letters, his legal code, the Mishnah Torah, and his philosophical text, The Guide to the Perplexed, all of which caused enormous controversy in the Jewish world in the generations following their publication. And it's also worth noting that The Guide to the Perplexed was written in such a way that Maimonides seems to have actually hidden his true opinions in the text. So it has a whole esoteric dimension despite being thought of as deeply naturalistic and a fundamentally rationalist text. At any rate, the guide is basically an attempt to help people avoid heresy, because that's nice, by carefully defining the terms used in the Hebrew Bible so that people don't think that God, you know, literally has a body. In fact, I think he's prompted to write the Guide to the Perplexed because of a form of Jewish mysticism that precisely focused on the divine body. You can learn more about that very strange form of Jewish mysticism up in the card above. As I mentioned, the Guide to the Perplexed is famously, or infamously, naturalistic and rationalistic with traditional forms of Jewish mysticism basically being reduced to Aristotelian physics and metaphysics. Angels become, well, metaphors, and even positive accounts of the divine nature are made into allegories. However, Maimonides' program runs into a problem when it comes to prophecy, because, you know, without prophecy, revealed religions like Judaism kind of, they kind of don't work. So what does Maimonides do? he turns to our good friend Aristotle and to the agent intellect. For Maimonides, if a person is especially rational, then the active intellect makes that person into a kind of metaphysician or a speculative philosopher. And if they are especially imaginative, they become a lawgiver. But if they are both rational and imaginative, that person becomes a prophet through the influx of the divine agent intellect. It's also worth noting that a similar position was also developed by Al-Farabi, which got him into trouble as well. I think Al-Ghazali even declared him kafir or a non-believer over stuff like this. At any rate, for Maimonides, prophecy is actually the dual result of a person cultivating both their rational and imaginative faculties such that they can receive the divine influx of the active intellect. Of course, the active intellect is what makes everybody able to think, but the prophetic person is, as you might imagine, incredibly gifted in this specific way. Now, I bet you're already asking the right question. How exactly does one cultivate one's rational and imaginative faculties to become a prophet? And I bet you're now seeing Abu Lafia's genius shining like a jewel. He sought to use the mystical Kabbalah fused with Maimonides' philosophical rationalism to create a system by which to become nothing short than a messianic prophet. 
it's all breathtaking in ambition, scope, and the synthesis of what should be completely impossible. The rationalism of Maimonides and the mysticism of Kabbalah. So we are wholly unsurprised to find that Abalafio was a public teacher of the Guide to the Perplexed and wrote no less than three separate commentaries on it. In fact, in the third commentary called the Sitre Torah, or the Secrets of the Torah, Abulafia provides 36 different Kabbalistic secrets that he finds hidden in the Guide to the Perplexed, thus transforming this arch-rational text into one of the deepest Kabbalistic secrets. To accomplish this, he applies seven different Kabbalistic tools to transform the plain meaning of the Guide to the Perplexed into a text brimming with secrets. For instance, Abulafia shows that the Selim and Demut are not only the Maimonidean form and intellect, which she transforms Genesis 1.26 from let us make man in our form according to our likeness to something like let us provide the human being with intellect that they may reason like us. But he also reads into them both the active and the passive intellects. How? Gematria, whereby numerical equality of Hebrew letters corresponds with conceptual identity. Thus, the active intellect and the imagination, or the passive intellect, are known, and form and likeness in Hebrew both equal to 616. You can see the Hebrew and add it up on the screen if you like. This is nothing less than a Kabbalistic integration of the guide into Abalafia's mystic regime for the production of the very prophets described in the guide itself. And as I mentioned a moment ago, this is just one of 36 such secrets that Abulafia finds hidden in the Guide to the Perplexed. So, does Abulafia's prophetic Kabbalah involve union with the Divine? Yes, but the Divine specifically in the form of the active intellect. Is this the totality of the Divine or exhaustive of the Divine? Here I'm pretty skeptical given Maimonides' dedication to a pretty strong negative theology and other factors related to the Kabbalah. While our intellect may have prophetic union with the divine intellect in the form of the active or agent intellect seems clear from Abalafia's system, but this is still a far cry from union with the divine in a total or absolute sense but it may be all that's possible either in this life or in this realm of existence. I'll leave that to the mystics. Regardless, what we have in Abulafia's system is just stunning. He manages to bridge the gulf between the rational and the mystical, the philosophical and the religious by uniting the philosophical rationalism of Maimonides with the meditative techniques of what he calls the Kabbalah of names into a system for uniting our intellect with the divine active intellect, thus giving all of us the chance to become prophets. It's a startling democratization of mysticism, and it's no wonder that these techniques for attaining prophetic ecstasy were basically not printed, and they were surely not widely published, and they were certainly widely condemned by religious elites, and to this day remain difficult to find in some ways even in Hebrew, much less in translation. Abba Lafia's project remains as elusive as it is ingenious. If you're interested in Kabbalah, Hermetic philosophy or the history of magic, make sure to subscribe here to Esoterica. Also, if you want to support my work of producing scholarly, accessible, and free content on topics in esotericism, consider supporting my work on Patreon or perhaps with a one time donation. Your support of Esoterica makes this channel possible. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, Abu Lafia's complete works remain in a bit of a complete mess. 
Printed editions have proven pretty unreliable over the centuries. In fact, they just leave out sections about the techniques for some of this stuff. And Moshe Adel has argued that a solid scholarship has to rely on the manuscripts themselves for reliable readings. Obviously, this is a serious barrier for even scholars, much less for everyday people who would like to access Abu Lafia's works. As you might imagine, translations of many of Abu Lafia's works into English simply they just don't exist. The closest thing to a complete works edition is the 13-volume gross edition, though the volumes by Aaron Barzani and Son are a bit more reliable, but they don't represent a complete works. I really hope that Abulafia's text will hopefully get the same kind of treatment as the recent Pritzker Zohar, but that isn't even on the horizon so far as I know. Of course, the most accessible introduction to Abulafia's mysticism is Moshe Idel's mystical experience. Not his mystical experience, personally, the book Mystical Experience, though basically anything published by Moshe Idel is fantastic. The text Mystical Experience is wonderfully anchored in Abulafia's writings, and the text is a tour de force. It's an absolute must for anyone wishing to dive into Abulafia. And of course, also Idel's studies in ecstatic Kabbalah is an important adjunct to this as well. There's a really cool article in there about the, whether or not the Cathars influenced Abulafia. I should also mention that the standard English edition of the Guide to the Perplexed is by Pines, but also worth checking out is Kellner's volume on the relationship of Maimonides' thinking with Jewish mysticism, which argues that the guide is actually a response to the Merkava Shi'or Koma mysticism, which I have to say I find generally convincing. Of course, for the esoteric dimension of Maimonides' writing, the classic source there is Leo Strauss's Persecution and the Art of Writing. But let me tell you, that is a serious rabbit hole. Hamavin Yavin. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and you've been watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.